I've lost my keys. I've lost my keys. How many rubber band stretches are there in that one? <laughs> I hope you're doing two. It's, I've lost my keys. Maybe instead of rubber bands, I should have one of those things that develops your muscles. <laughs> it would get the lungs working. I've lost my keys. Right. <laughs> now, you know what I'm going to ask you to do now. Show what you have written to the person sitting next to you. And th this way, you can see if you agree. Well, that's very good. It's not exactly right. All right, okay. Right. Now, the great advantage of sharing ideas or teamwork is that if you want to ask a question, uh, you can always say, he doesn't know, <laughs> can you please tell my friend the answer to this? And uh, it's a way of getting over the difficulty of not knowing. So I've lost my keys, I've lost my keys. Right. See if you can take down the next line following the advice I've just been giving you. You're always losing your keys. You're always losing your keys. You're always losing your keys. Even if your phonetic symbols are a bit rusty, you can work out the intonation pattern and draw a curve showing me the pitch. You're always losing your keys. 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 And when you're ready, please compare notes. <laughs> compare notes and see if you agree. Ah, some really good ones here. Yeah. You're always losing your keys. You're always losing your keys. Stresses in this phrase, how many beats in the rhythm? You're always losing your keys. You're always losing your keys. Well, there are three beats in the rhythm. The first one is the nucleus, the main accent. So I would like you to have chosen the first one, the one on always, and definitely have marked that. The ones which follow it more difficult to hear because it, it's at a low pitch. So we only have the rhythm to guide us, no pitch to guide us in finding those later beats. And what you should have marked is something like this. You're always losing your keys. You're always losing your keys. As I explained, only the first of those stresses is obligatory, really. The one on losing and the one on keys, hard to hear. Now, there are one or two interesting points in this for ear training. The first is, you know I'm a speaker of British English, therefore I make use of linking R. Here, in the later part of the sentence, we see the word your written without an R. That's the way I normally pronounce it. The first word in the sentence is another occurrence of your, but because always begins with a vowel, I must insert the R. So I have to say, you're always. 
you're always. I think it's true, many learners of English think that your, in the sense you are, should be your, or something like this. It's not wrong to say your, but frankly, I would advise you to give it up and just say your <laughs> all the time. Your in the sense you are, and your in the sense possessive. The native speakers of British English, they're the same. <laughs> you don't need to say you are. Um, so I, I would give it up. <laughs> just say your. your. May I interrupt you? Please. I have a question. Yes. question. Yes. Uh, first sentence. Uh, you, you pronounce, I brought my keys. I brought my keys. When, when you pronounce slowly, yeah. uh, do you always omit key? Right. You heard the question. Is, is the omission of the T in loss, is that controlled by the rate of speaking? Maybe to some extent. Um, what has made you think about this is the sensitivity of the linking R to the following vowel. In the case of linking R, we have a process which is controlled by the context. Is, the question is, is the loss of the T controlled by the context in the same way here? Well, maybe, but I think I can say, even going quite slowly, I've lost my keys. I've lost my keys, even when going slowly. Um, so, of course, what you can't do is pause. If you're going to pause, if you're going to have the end of a phrase after the word lost, then the T would be included. Where are my keys? They're lost. We can't say, where are my keys? They're lost. The T must be included if I'm stopping at that point. But provided I haven't actually finished the phrase, even when going slowly, it's OK to omit the T. So it's not only in rapid speech that it happens. That's a very interesting question, and thank you very much. You're always losing your keys. Now, the intonation pattern was the same as the one I had in I've lost my keys. Functionally the same. Low pitch here, high pitch, and then all of this was low pitch. You're always losing your keys. You're always losing your keys. Increasingly now, uh, in ear training at home, I would reinforce a point like this by making an acoustic analysis of the pattern live. So uh, on the computer at the same time as the presentation, I would have speech analysis software running. Uh, there are two ways to get the speech into that, that program. Either I can have prepared a recording beforehand and selected the phrases I think I might want to analyze. Or another way is obviously to have a microphone, do a live recording, or maybe get one of the students to do the recording, and then analyze the pattern on the screen straight away. It's very easy nowadays just to do this. Um, you probably have speech analysis software on your computer if you're interested in speech, but uh, there's some excellent software available free on the UCL homepage written by Mark Huckvale. The WASP is a wonderful program that lets you do waveforms and spectrograms and pitch curves immediately. So this is good not only to reinforce the ear training you're doing, but also to get people used to quickly looking at the acoustic representations of speech and become accustomed to them. So instead of teaching them at great length about acoustic phonetics, just start using fundamental frequency curves and they get used to the idea the students accept them. Are there any more questions about you're always losing your keys? Question? Yes. Uh, the second sentence, uh, is it okay to omit the uh, always L, L, L sound? Oh, thank you. Thank you for that question, yes. Always is a word which has many possible pronunciations. Uh, the question was about the L. Yes, uh, it's possible to say always, always, without an L. Some speakers of English 
vocalize L's, that is, turn L's into vowels. But quite independently of that, even speakers like me who don't regularly vocalize their dark L's uh, have an alternative pronunciation of always without the L. So if you look up always uh, in a, a dictionary like um, the Longman Pronunciation Dictionary, you will find dozens of, uh, maybe dozens is an exaggeration, but many different pronunciations. There's another uh, difference in pronunciation, and that is the vowel in the second syllable. Instead of saying always, you can say always, whiz. And bearing in mind the presence or absence of L, that gives you four variants. So you've got always, or always, or always, or always. Now, uh, I don't know whether, uh, or what you think about this, but the always pronunciation is one that, uh, generally speaking, if I'm teaching advanced learners of English, I encourage them to adopt the pronunciation always, for the reason that it is less like the spelling. And the reason to adopt a pronunciation that's less like the spelling is that then you sound as if you've learned spoken English and you're not just reading aloud written English. Do you follow my reasoning? That <laughs> well. If you're speaking English by reading out what is written, you would read always. But if you have learnt English by talking to speakers in a more natural way, you would have encountered the pronunciation always. Therefore, by choosing always, you give the impression that you have learnt your English in a natural way rather than from the book. It's a tiny detail, but it's the kind of thing which is very impressive when one hears it from a good speaker of English for whom English is a foreign language or a, a second language. They say always, and unconsciously you think, ah, oh, this speaker is very good. They're not just reading out what is written. But the truth is, any of the pronunciations will do perfectly well. Any will do. And yes, the L is optional. There is more to my passage, as you've heard. I've got to find them, it's a fall rise, a falling rising pitch on find. I've got to find them, I've got to find them. The pitch here is low on I've, goes high on got, comes down, and then does something like that. I've got to find them, da 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 da. I've got to find them. This fall-rise pattern is a very characteristic intonation pattern of English, both British and American, I think. It's a pattern which many learners of English find difficult to copy or think ridiculous. It sounds very strange. Find them. And I wanted to show you that phrase because on find, I've done what I did with lost, that is, I've omitted a D in just the same way as I said lost my, I can say find them, find them without the D. Of course, you don't have to do these processes in your own speech, but you do have to listen to them, and you have to be able to recognize them when you hear them. They're following rules. They're regular things one can learn to predict them and recognize them. I wonder if I have time just to do one final little bit of ear training before I go. I wanted you to try a nonsense word. Now, a lot of our ear training is done with meaningless words, meaningless materials. Um, just the rest of my passage flashing past. Nonsense words, or as one of my students called them, rubbish words. <laughs> Nonsense words, meaningless words where you have only your perception to guide you. You can't guess, you can't go by the context, you can't look them up in the dictionary, you must choose the sounds. Now, I have an English word here. 
Maybe the best thing is if I show you one nonsense word before trying one completely cold. So I'll, I'll reveal my first nonsense word to you and show you what I mean. This would have been the first one, and it says, a believe, a believe. So I'm going to say something like this. I'll, I'll stand up, I'll say, a believe, a believe, six times. You have to write down. And then, of course, the kind of thing we're listening for is, have you got this voiced fricative at the end, or have you changed it to a V? Have you got the right diphthong here? Was this heard as a B instead of a V? All of the things which might happen through misperception. So I'll take my second word and pronounce it. See if you can take it down in phonetic symbols. Are you ready? It's Jainvath. 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 Oh, we have some real experts here today. Jainvath. 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 And again, once you have a version, I would like you to show it to your neighbor and negotiate the answer. Jainvath. Yes, four repetitions. Jainvath. Jane bath. Jane bath. Actually I should have been on I should have been on telly there with a big picture of my mouth showing so you could do the lip reading. <laughs> this is my word Jane bath. Now, only you know what mistakes you made, if any. If you, didn't, if you didn't make any mistakes, then you may give yourself a round of applause. I don't have any prizes with me, unfortunately. Are there points in this word you would like me to try differently? Obviously, to make the ear training interactive, what should happen is, you tell me your mistakes, and then I do the two versions in contrast, until I'm sure that you can hear the difference each time. And you always have to have a kind of statistical thing in the back of your mind. How many times have you to be able to hear a contrast correctly to be sure you can do it? You actually need to do it about six times correctly in succession before you're sure that you can do it. Good. Right. OK. I was hoping somebody would ask me that. <laughs> the question is about the nasal which is the end of the first syllable. This is a celebrated difficulty for Japanese. Is it a, an alveolar nasal, or is it a velar nasal? And of course, if you couldn't see me, you might even think it was a bilabial nasal. My version is Jainvath, Jainvath, and the one with the alveolar is Jainvath, Jainvath. I don't know how well this difference is being conveyed through the sound reinforcement system. Let's call mine one. Mine is one, and the changed version is two. Is this one or two? I'll do them first of all. One is Jainvath. Two, Jainvath. Which is this? Jainvath. Jain is one. There is an auditory difference, plainly. Which is this Jain bath. Jain bath was one again. I do this sometimes. <laughs> Two is Jain bath. Jain. You're listening to a tiny detail at the end of the diphthong, whether it's going ein, ein, or ein, ein, I think. I would like to just 
Uh, thank you for listening. I congratulate you on your participation. Thank you very much.